Hey everybody, welcome back to Earn and Invest. I am so excited for today's episode with Dan Chan, the billionaire's magician. But before we get to that, I'm going to once more tell you about the survey we have at earnandinvest.com slash survey. It helps me really do two things. One is we do have advertisers, and I want to make sure the advertisements actually interest the community, and therefore I need to know more about our community so we can make sure those advertisements are tailored. The other thing is, as I'm choosing guests, it helps to know the demographics of who we're creating this podcast for. So it's really easy. It's anonymous. It's free. It's simple. It'll take you a minute or two. Just go to earnandinvest.com slash survey. I totally appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the show. This is Dan Chan, the Millionaire's Mentalist on the Earn and Invest podcast. Our guest today, Dan Chan, is an internationally renowned, award-winning magician and mind reader. In 2016, BuzzFeed profiled Dan with an article titled, Meet Silicon Valley's Favorite Magician. In November of 2020, he was featured in Business Insider as the billionaire's magician. His client list reads like a who's who of Silicon Valley, including Google, Apple, Facebook, Intel, and Oracle. But magic wasn't always at the forefront of Dan's career. Before he was a full-time magician, he was a pre-IPO employee at PayPal, where he crossed paths with the likes of Elon Musk and many of the soon-to-be founders of Silicon Valley's most promising startups. He had only vested 13 months of his stock options when he decided to give up the remaining three-fourths to pursue performing magic full-time. Since then, he has performed over 5,000-plus shows for many of the most recognizable companies in the world. Dan has an insatiable drive to become what he calls legendary, which has spurred him into many money-making and experiential adventures, including working in Michelin-rated restaurants and, of all things, day trading. In the first part of this interview, we discuss his career trajectory, what he has learned from performing magic from high-flying tech companies, and his pivot to creating in a virtual world. The conversation continues in the after show, where we unexpectedly dive into a controversial conversation of what it's meant to have enough and when he will be content with his career goals. Don't forget to listen all the way to the end. I realized early on in my career that I was doing the wrong thing. I had finished my residency and I was practicing as an internal medicine physician. But what I really wanted to do was write and public speak. Those were my passions. But there was this voice in my head, this voice that kept on saying to me, you can do those things for fun but you can't make a living doing them. And that voice persisted for decades while I built my career as a physician, which I liked, but I didn't love. Fast forward to my mid-40s, when I started to understand my finances, I realized that I was financially independent, that I didn't have to work anymore to make a living. And I slowly withdrew myself from my job as a physician and started to do things that I loved. I started to write. I started to podcast. I started to public speak. And I was much happier than when I was spending my busy hours during the day seeing patients. But it really makes me wonder, what if in my early 20s, I had followed my passion? What if I had walked away sooner from medicine or never even went to medical school and started to do what I really wanted to do with my time? What about you? What would you be doing if you pursued your passions and didn't worry about making money? Would you be an actor, a painter, a magician? Could you make a living at it? Dan Chan left the startup world to pursue his passion in magic. After over 5,000 plus shows, he's been dubbed by Business Insider as the billionaire's magician as well as Silicon Valley's favorite. And he has not only survived, but thrived in this pandemic-driven virtual world. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Doc G. I am so excited to hear more about your story. But as I was looking at your webpage, I was struck by one thing, and I really have to ask you this question. Is it true that you studied Romanian shortchange artists, Ukrainian pickpockets, as well as con men and hustlers in order to learn some of the skills you now display in your magic shows? I actually met a Ukrainian shortchange artist. I, I met someone who was a pickpocket, and it was funny because he was at one of my shows. 
and I pick uh, I, I pickpocketed his friend. And then later he couldn't help but tell me that he was a pickpocket when he was younger. And he actually showed me his technique and he bumped into me and he was showing me how he would do it. And he said, he said, I'm rusty, but this is what we used to do. I'm like, wow, this is absolutely fascinating. So I put that in there. And there's a lot of stories that I tell in my show that help people get to know both myself and the spectators. Like this new show that I've written has a element called yes, no, get to know. And I ask people, would they skydive, bungee jump, or eat a rattlesnake, or even a salmon heart while it's still beating? And those questions aren't just reflective of other people. They're actually reflective of myself because I've done all those things. It's really interesting because a big part of your magic seems to be your personal experiences. You've studied some of these people who've done this stuff, the pickpockets, the con men, but you also spent a lot of time in kitchens. You studied and worked behind the scenes in some fine restaurants, not only in the U.S., in Europe. How has that affected your magic shows? Well, I have a goal in mind and I'm trying to look for investors and also pre-sale, perhaps something like a Kickstarter, uh, because I realized that there are certain companies that I knew they didn't need money, but they needed people to follow along. For example, if you know the story about Microsoft, they did not need the money where they were at, but they wanted to get a little bit of press and they were already profitable. So there's certain companies like that. I'd, and that's where I'm at right now. I would love to blend Michelin rated dining with a magic club like the Magic Castle. That's an interesting idea. And, and what I'm learning here from you is that while magic seems to be your passion, you certainly seem to also have a business mind. Let's go back to the beginning. You started your career outside of magic, actually in the startup world. Is that right? Yeah. I graduated from UC Riverside with a business administration degree. So I studied things like SWOT analysis, Porter's Five Forces, Blue Ocean Strategy. Then shortly afterwards, after graduating, I was at PayPal pre-IPO with Elon Musk and guys who had eventually founded things like YouTube and Yelp and many other companies like Stripe. And that was just an incubator of great ideas. So help me understand, because I feel like if you listen to my introduction, I was kind of stuck in this place where I went into medicine, but I was too afraid to make the jump to something else. You were there at PayPal pre-IPO with all these amazing people. How and why did you leave to go into magic? Believe it or not, I thought PayPal was a sinking ship. <laughs> there were Russian mobsters and fraudsters, <laughs> and we were told about our burn rate. And I'm like, this doesn't make business sense. A company's losing $60,000 a month or whatever they were losing a month. And I'm like, eh, if you don't find another round of financing, you're out. But at least I have my stock option. So I vested at 12. Uh, you know, you vest after one year. I stayed 13 months, but I was bored. I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. And I was making more on the side because they have these anchors for you. They're like, if you stay this long, you can cash out. But if you're truly not happy doing what you're doing, it doesn't matter how much they're paying you. And I started making more money, to be honest, as a kid's entertainer. You know, I started off doing birthday parties, twisting balloons, juggling fire, and just doing all this variety art. And I was having so much more fun doing that, figuring out the magic. Why magic or kids entertainment as opposed to business? I mean, what you were doing was a far cry from the entertainment industry. How did they connect? It was sexy to me because I saw other guys who were 10 years ahead of me in the in magic making $800 to $1,000 for an hour's worth of work. So I was like, I, you know, I could see 10 years down the line. I want to do that. Was there some sense of imposter syndrome? Because you had planned on, you had gone to school, you had trained to be in the business world, so to speak. Were you afraid that you didn't have what it takes to make it as a magician, especially in the beginning? Because that's kind of, you know, it's pretty ballsy to say, okay, I'm leaving 13 months out. I'll vest what I can. 
and then throw yourself into a completely, utterly different field. Did you have some type of training that made you comfortable with that? I went to a lot of lectures, but I had more of an imposter syndrome at PayPal than I had as a magician, to be honest. That's why I was so eager to leave. So I have this finance degree and I'm in PayPal finance, but I'm sending in uh, bank deposits to Silicon Valley Bank every day. People would sign up for PayPal. We would credit their account, maybe 14 cents and 13 cents, two different amounts that they had to verify. But there would always be that one person who thought that they'd have to pay us back. So they would mail us either coins or a check in the mail. Because we're a bank, what I had to do (laughs) was I had to credit their account and then make a bank deposit. And that was with my finance degree. So (laughs) all the high-level finance, which was mergers, acquisitions, and things that you dream of doing, (laughs) was not what I was doing. And I, I imagined trying to do like high profile transactions. And I realized that was a glorified bank teller. I'm like, screw this. I'm out. Wow. I really connect with that because in a sense, when you said you felt more like imposter syndrome in your finance job than being a magician, I could say almost the same thing for being a physician. A lot of the time I'm like, what am I doing here? Should I be here? Whereas I didn't feel that same trepidation when I was writing or public speaking or some of those things that was a little more a passion for me. So you leave PayPal and you start doing magic full time. Was it difficult to start a business? Like, did you know what you were doing? Did you know how to organize it? How were those first few years? You really never know what you don't know. So you just go online. And fortunately for me, Google was coming up and these old guys were advertising in the yellow pages and they were just really happy with the status quo. For me, I was ending up on the top of Google search engine and search uh, results because I was looking at the source code. And these top magicians would ask me for (laughs) advice, but I wouldn't tell them my secret. I wish I told them the secret because maybe they would have told me some of their secrets because I was charging way less. And I didn't realize that they weren't competition. I thought of them as competition. And when I started not thinking of people as competition, my career really took off. Wow. There's a few interesting things there. One is you learn to market yourself well through understanding SEO and the Google source code was more important maybe than your actual skills as a magician at that point. In a lot of ways, I knew title tags, meta tags, and alt tags, and how to game the system. And I also ended up going on a website and finding whatever was on the top of Google. And for some reason, I saw the meta tag and I cut and paste it. And then I didn't realize that they were a top of Google. And that ended <laughs> that put me on the top of Google. So wow. steal from your competitors. I didn't steal from magicians. I steal from other places. And tell me more about this idea that when you stop looking at other magicians as competitors, you actually really moved ahead. Why? What exactly happened? Well, once I started sharing with magicians and started realizing that they could give me information and that we had totally different performing styles and performing personalities, then I became a thought leader because most magicians are so selfish. So like I'm in this several groups on Facebook and it's, they're talking technology. They're not willing to share. So when I see someone wanting to help, I'm providing that information. And because no one else is doing that, everyone knows me. So let's talk about you more as a thought leader. As we mentioned, Business Insider called you the billionaire magician. You've been dubbed Silicon Valley's favorite magician, the millionaire's mentalist. Why such an interest in corporate America and wealth? Why did you kind of connect with that part of society? It was just a natural progression. But looking on hindsight, I realized that it's easier to spend someone else's money than for people to spend their own money because one, it's a tax write-off and there's always an expense for it. So I work for billionaires and millionaires, but you would not believe how cheap some of these guys are. (laughs) For their own family party, they will spend a fraction of what their secretary will spend because they're rewarding employees. If they don't spend it, they're going to get taxed on it. But if they're spending their own money, they've already been taxed on it. So let's talk about some of the unique magical offerings you have. 
the first that hits me as interesting is pickpocketing. Like you do a whole series of teaching and you do a whole show or at least part of a show on pickpocketing. How did that become a part of your routine? Meeting the best in the world and the best is Apollo Robbins. He was famous for the, his TED Talks. You've probably seen him as a movie consultant in the Will Smith movies and, and many other movies. He's, he's very, very famous. He's the number one magician. But I went to a place called Caesar's Magical Empire, now defunct. And I've been to so many magical magic venues and I want to create one. But he stuck his hand in my pocket. And he got a little bit friendly with me. <laughs> what do you think is so exciting for people to see pickpockets? Like, what is the glamour involved with it? You don't think it, it can actually happen to you. When in reality, if you don't know what's coming up, I'm going to get you all the time. And people swear that it's never going to happen to them. And I used to do this challenge where I would tell someone, like their friend, hey, would you like to see me pickpocket your friend? I'll just say, I'm going to pickpocket him. And they're like, yes, do it. (laughs) When you're at a party and you tell someone, that's like the thing that legends are made out of. And as Michael Weber has said, he who tells the best story in life wins. I imagine it is a fun skill to have at a party. Uh, And (laughs) you walk it around the end like, whose watch is this? (laughs) Whose wallet is this? It must be quite entertaining. Yeah, I have given back $250,000 watches and even million, probably million dollar watches from people after I've taken it off the wrist. Wow. I, one guy was like, that watch is, t-, you know, and I looked it up afterwards and I'm like, wow, that was $250,000. <laughs> that was, at that time, it was probably what I would earn in two, two years. So it was, it was insane. Do you ever get caught? Rarely. That's interesting. Because I imagine, I would imagine if you do this enough that people catch you, but you've probably been practicing for so long, I, that must be a little awkward. Yeah. Well, when you do get caught, you just move on. But I've taken probably a 5,000 plus things because I, at one time I was just, I, I would, I would set goals for myself. I would be like, I'm in this party of a thousand people. My goal is just to do pickpocketing. And I just said, Hey, I'm going to I'm going to introduce myself, do as a few tricks as possible. And I would, I would set records for myself because I said, Hey, the only way to do this is to get, is to do it over and over again. There's a thousand people. Like if you're in a group, a small intimate group, you only get away with it once. But if you're at a Google or Facebook party and there's 500 or a thousand people, you might as well try things that will make you legend versus like hacking into iPhones. Why would I want to do card tricks as much? if there's so much more opportunity that, and that's how the legend kind of came through as I consciously thought to myself, how do I put myself in front of these influencers? Like when I was doing these events for Google, I would find out who the most important person in the room was from the secretary. And I would circle that person. I would never walk up to them. I used to walk up to them, but I realized that that was the worst thing to do. They would see too much. I used to show everyone everything. Now the most important person in the room only sees, you know, three of my best tricks and I leave and then they want to have me at the event again and again because they're like, show me more. But I I show them so little that they want more of it. I've noticed you've mentioned it a few times. This idea of being legendary is really important to your shows. This idea of going big or not at all seems to pervade how you practice. Yeah, I think about it in terms of a story. I think about it, if someone were to write my life story, what would they write about? There's a, there's a hierarchy. There's so many magicians, but there's so many magicians that actually pick pockets. There's so many magicians that will, will juggle fire. There's so many magicians who have kids who are following their footsteps, let alone juggling three flaming torches and picking pockets themselves at age 13. So we mentioned picking pockets. You've talked about juggling and flamethrowing, or you just mentioned it there. Another one of your offerings, which I was surprised to see on your website, is you do team building and creativity workshops. How did that come about? I actually stopped leaning into that because I actually felt like I was faking it. So I still have it up there. Occasionally people will ask me, but it's more like they'll ask me about it. And then I'll try to steer them back toward my regular offerings. But 
I saw other people doing it and I said, I'm going to try doing it. But I realized that that wasn't what really resonated with me. If people ask me to do it, yeah, can I do it? Yes. But do I feel the most comfortable doing it? Not, not exactly. But sometimes you need someone, you need a second offering or add on. Like if they've hired you one year, they'll want you to do something else. You have clients that are so loyal. Like, for example, I said, Google's hired me well over 40 times. But if they were to say, hey, can you do this? I'm going to say yes to it. Yeah. Tell me more about why you're less comfortable doing that. Did it just not feel like it was part of your skill set? I'm not as rehearsed. I love improvising and I love close-up magic because of that. But perhaps later in the future, I might do more team building and have more of a structured approach. There's, we can get into that a little bit later because that's a big rabbit hole I can go down. Let's also talk about the fact that this is different than the time when you started, right? So when you started in the 2000s was a much different time than post or intra pandemic times that we live in. How did you transition to the virtual world? I realized that I needed to go on a global scale. So I pitched reporters for a business insider through LinkedIn. I pitched every single reporter you could (laughs) imagine. And I got these weird open rates and I started getting better at it, but I pitched Forbes wired. I pitched SF gate and it was just realizing that I had to be one of the first there. And I needed to be on the top of the mind awareness in the zoom world, because now I was competing against major players who have been on AGT America's got talent and of that nature. And knowing how to tell a story is just as important. For example, a lot of magicians show what they can do already visually. So there's no surprise, but if I wrote something, if someone wrote something about me, they still wouldn't know what I look like or what to expect. So that leaves an element of surprise and video gives it all away. When you transitioned to the virtual world, a lot of us, especially entertainers, were looking at the likelihood of a drop in their income, a drop in your net worth. You actually experienced the opposite, right? Did I see that your net worth went up like five or 600% during the pandemic? How did that happen? Like, how did you get there? Well, I doubled down on the number of shows I could do. I did 52 shows in one week, 12 shows in a day. I did eight shows back to back on the half hour. So I was doing one, one thirty, all the way up to like 5 PM. And I also started investing and looking at my portfolio every day and investing in my IRA. So I would trade in and out of positions. And when you're you know, that, that's the reason why I wanted to be on your podcast. I, most people just look at me as a magician, but they don't realize that I have a strategic mindset and I'm an, also an investor. So I'm looking for investors as well. I just recently bought like seventy dollars or $80,000 worth of Lenovo. I've, I've been hired by a lot of companies. And for every time they hire me, I buy at least one token share stock. So Google's hired me 40 plus times. Imagine what I'm accumulating over the years. You have to invest in people who support you. But not only that, it makes for a great story because no magician prior to them hearing about my story has invested in every single company that has hired them. You know, I have a lot of, when you're at the top of what you're doing, you have a lot of copycats and imitators. It's an interesting look at investing. Do you think by performing for these companies, you get any insight into why or why not they would be a good company stock to buy? Yeah, absolutely. Company culture. You can see how much cash they have to burn. Like certain companies like Amazon, I've realized that although they've hired me many times, they have a cheaper culture. Like it's kind of like their door delivery, their average salary to the the people that they bring on is lower. So they're going to have a lot harder time retaining people. Although he is mythical and almost mysterious. So you don't really know, but I actually think Google is the best stock ever because every time someone clicks on an ad, you're making money. Think about that business model. The more you think about it, the more that you realize all these companies surrounding it pay Google for their advertising. Like when Groupon first started, they advertised on Google and Facebook. But also, you 
the company culture like of Google is do no evil. And I think they truly believe it because I've, I've been in other interactions with certain corporations that are just as big as Google and that, and I've had them cancel events on me and do other things that I was like, this is just a reflection of the people on top. And you, and that's the reason why certain movies were made of certain people, because those weren't just myths, but that's reflected in their company culture, even though they're market, you know, monopolies almost all of them are, at least Google has committed themselves to really playing as fair as they can. When you're great, you're, you're still going to dominate. But when the, when the news media was confronted by Australian news media, did this Google and Facebook, you saw the way that Google reacted and you saw the way that other companies reacted. Immediately, Google offered that up. They weren't trying to kill the competitors, but other companies were really thinking of monopolistic. It's it's kind of like Google already learned the lesson from Bill Gates, you know, <laughs> why he was taken down. But other people haven't because they have still have something to prove. But those two guys are really humble and they are, you know, I think overall good guys. And I think it's shown in the company cultures with the perks that they give. They truly want to treat their employees well. Yeah, it's a take on this idea of investing what you know. By working with these companies, you get a good feel for who they are and what their culture is. Have you ever had them pay you in stock as opposed to cash? The article on CNBC talks about how I was compensated for my early contributions as an Airbnb host or experience host. But I also kept things going with a lot of these companies, I give them lots of feedback. What sort of feedback? Just on what I would do, I'd spend a lot of extra time because you know that they're growing. So you want to be on the top of the mind awareness. You want to be legendary in internal groups, not just as a great magician, but a great guy that they'll recommend you in those circles. Let's take a quick break. We're talking with the billionaire's magician, Dan Chan. In 2016, BuzzFeed profiled Dan with an article titled, Meet Silicon Valley's Favorite Magician. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. Wish you were in early on some of the best performing IPOs of 2019 and 2020. Our crowd investors were, and now you can join them in what's next. With our crowd, accredited investors have access to invest directly, easily, and most importantly, early. Our crowd investors have benefited from our crowd companies IPOing like Beyond Meat or being bought by companies like Nike, Intel, Microsoft, and Oracle. Our crowd's investment professionals leverage their extensive network to review some of the most promising private companies and startups in the world. Their in depth due diligence includes meeting with management teams and generally comprehensive vetting of deals they decide to make part of their own portfolio. Today, you can join our crowd's investment in Cyto Reason. Cytoreason has partnered with five of the 10 largest pharma companies to deliver life-saving drugs at a fraction of the time and cost. Cytoreason's AI models the human body at the molecular level, completely changing what's possible in the trillion-dollar drug development landscape. You can get in early on Cytoreason and other unique opportunities at rcrowd.com slash EAI. If you're interested in investing, you need to join our crowd. The R crowd account is free. Just go to o u r c r o w d dot com slash e a i. Welcome back. Dan Chan left pre IPO PayPal to pursue his passion for creating and performing magic. Since then, he has performed over five thousand plus shows for many of the most recognizable companies in the world. It's interesting. Do you think that your career in magic has taught you about investing? Like you now, it sounds like are investing your IRA and that's now become part of your story, become part of your legend. Did being a magician make you better at this? Did it teach you how to work in the stock market? Being a magician didn't help me in the stock market. It helped me realize which companies were on the board. Like if I wasn't a magician, I would not have known companies like Palantir or Yelp as early as where I found them. Like, for example, one guy said, oh, I work for Neil. And I was like, what's Neil? It's an electrical car company. Oh, oh, 
It's like Tesla. <laughs> Let me throw a little bit of money here. Oh, it jumped up. Let me throw more money in it. And I ended up making 600% gains on Neil. But I would not have known that. They didn't give me any information. They just said, I work for Neil. And I just Googled and I said, oh, what is Neil? Oh, it's an electric car company. Oh, if there's a chance that it's going to get big, let's just put a little bit of money to track it. I put on like a mile marker and say, hey, I performed for the guy who, Neil, let me just buy one share. You see the volatility, you research more, and then you invest in what you know. When you have the freedom or financial freedom, you start taking more risk. And the risk that you take is in proportion to the amount that you have researched. A lot of people say that it is very hard to get the stock market right. It's very hard to know when to time your buys and when to time your sells. Any fear that you're getting in over your head or any fear that you'll find over time, it's very hard to beat the market, so to speak? Well, if you're reading every day like Warren Buffett is, you're going to probably achieve similar results. And then if you're networking and you're talking to the right people, for me, I'm way up like if the stock market were to crash today in half, I'm still up. So I can sleep pretty well. Like if you, it's, it's your mile marker. It's when did you get in? For example, if I just got in and I'm only up 10%, if it falls 10%, I'm worried. But historically, there aren't that many days where it falls to 33%. But if that were to happen, what I have in cash, I'm probably going to cash out a majority of what I have in cash and buy the ones with good PE ratios, low debt to equity, and companies with a specific competitive advantage. It sounds like you've been very thoughtful about your investing strategy. Do you think you'll ever leave magic to become more of a full-time investor? I probably will even make more in these coming years as an investor in my personal portfolio than I can at magic because of just the compounding that's occurred and me, my daily habits of looking at the stock market in the morning and doing my 10 trades by just looking at the news and also just seeing, uh, doing a stock analysis and a screener. But even if I'm making more money investing, who wouldn't want to go to these epic parties and network in a hobnob with, you know, billionaires? So it sounds like you left startup America to become a magician, which was your passion. As a magician, you made extra money, which allowed you to jump in and out of the stock market, which made you even more money, which means you can go back to doing what is your passion, but maybe worry less about getting exactly a specific job or not. It's an interesting story and not necessarily when I was expecting when we started this podcast. Tell me what's in your future. So where, what do you see going forward? What are your goals? I have lots of goals. I don't always hit them because I realize that you can only accomplish so much. So I've put goals like, hey, I wanted to do a documentary, which I, we just completed. I've done, I'm thinking of maybe a, a music video or learning how to do certain other things to make the story better because I still haven't hit being on Fortune or Forbes or any of the other things. But I was thinking it'd be cooler if I just showed them, you know, $10 million in five years and say, Hey, this, I was a magician. And now I'm like worth 10 million or hundred million. Then they would, they would not ignore me as opposed to say, Hey, I just only do this. So I was just thinking, what is a common threads between the people who are in Forbes so, while well, they're globally known? So what are the steps to get globally known, reverse engineer it, different aspects of your story, whether it may be me working in Europe at restaurants to other restaurants that charge you $300 a head. I'm studying their culture. So if I can bring magical element to that, I could secure investors a lot easier to open up a venue that would be in its class of its own. And that's world-class. So once I can figure those elements. So I have this book talking about food illusions. So if I can find enough investors, I'm going to create a venue where I would have shadow puppets like th this uh, rabbit. I would have a bang, the lights would turn on and we would serve rabbit. I would produce a dove and I would actually serve them doves. Hmm. 
and I would have oranges where it would be oranges and Jello because you see in Chinese restaurants you see these oranges they serve you but they're just plain oranges. I was thinking maybe we could nitrogen freeze the oranges, smash them, and put them back in the Jello so it has texture. So it takes it to the next level because people are searching for experiences, especially those who are rich. They also want to invest in stories. They want to invest in things that are interesting because if money were no object, which it is for them, they want to change the world. They want to reach Mars, even though it's so impossible. This is just replicating a formula from different places. And I look at myself more as a Disney or a Pixar Imagineer in this next level of coordination is bringing on team members who can execute on a specific vision. And that is where I I hope to see myself. But until then, I'm going to continue to do that, do these magic shows virtually and build up momentum. Yeah, I hear two themes as you talk. One is this idea of being legendary and the other is being an entertainer. And it seems like that is the common thread because when I listen to you, you really get involved in a lot of stuff. So you're talking about magic, but you're talking about restaurants. You're talking about stock trading. You're talking about being involved with these major corporations as well as major media like Forbes, et cetera. It hits me that that these are all pieces of your personality and this idea of doing it bigger and better is somewhat innate to you. Yeah. You have to dream big and you can't limit yourself on these possibilities. Like people are telling me, dad, you can't be on business insider. They're not going to feature a magician. I'm like, (laughs) wait, wait till you, (laughs) when I had that, everyone was like, Oh, you did it. Like people told me no. And when they say no, I even want to do it more because I want, I just want to prove them wrong. People, more people have told me no to so many things that I've actually ended up pursuing because I just love proving them wrong. Whether it takes me five or 10 years, it's going to happen. People said, oh, you're not going to get, you're not going to be a consultant to like Airbnb. One of my mentors, he actually showed me that he could get stock options. And he showed me like, he said, hey, I made this from, I forgot what company that he got. And I was like, if you can do it, I can probably do it. It might take me 10 years, but I'll do it. So it ended up (laughs) taking me over 10 years to replicate it, to get shares in a company uh, like Airbnb. And once it happens once, it'll probably happen more often, a lot easier. Because once you've hit it the first time, it's like the four minute mile. Once you realize there's no barrier, other people are going to actually have that happen to them. Tell me a little bit about your son. I mean, he's an entertainer unto himself. It sounds like he is following in your footsteps. Yeah, I'm pushing him. I'm a Thai, Asian tiger dad. <laughs> I, I pushed him to juggle fire. I pushed him to pick pockets. I pushed him to do a lot of uncomfortable things, including audition for the Magic Castle. But he, he always afterwards, he thanks me for it. And including the people I coach. I push them to do things that are very uncomfortable for them. And I'm used to being off balance on purpose. Tell me more about your coaching. Is that just coaching people are interested in magic or do you do general coaching? If people find out that I do coaching, I'll offer it to them. I don't do it for the money because I I probably don't charge as much as I should, but I enjoy doing it. It's like being uh, a Renaissance person. Someone was telling me he caught himself a Renaissance person and he was a juggler, a guy named Dan Holtzman. And he just mentioned something like, I was like, that's a really cool thing being a Renaissance person. And I, I was like, who says you can't do all these other things? Who says I can't work at Club Med? You know, I did work at Club Med for a week. I still work at a summer camp every summer. And my kids go to this $2,000 camp while I teach magic to everyone else. So it's really interesting. People say you can't do it. Why can't you? You just are holding on to something so tightly that you don't give yourself the opportunity. There's a lot of business people who find out that I'm willing to share what I do. And I've had very, very famous CEOs. In fact, a billionaire hire me to teach them how to do magic. And I've had people gift me as a gift to certain families who are very influential because they have everything that they want. And they say, Hey, we're going to, Dan, will you go to their house and be the magician as the, their gift? And, and that's, that's really interesting. Can anyone learn magic? How much is it the person and their skill versus just learning the trade? 
you can learn it from books, DVDs, and lectures, but the best thing that you can do is just hire someone like myself to teach because you cut down on the learning curve. The problem is most magicians aren't willing to share really good stuff, but I don't consider myself like a magician. So what I'm sharing is things that most people hold really close to their chest, which might get me some slack in the magic community because they're like, that's too good to share. I'm like, <laughs> forget you. I don't, I, I'm already in a different space. If people ask me sincerely and they're willing to pay the price, I show them a an insane amount, which is ridiculous because most magicians define themselves by that one thing. I don't define myself just as a magician. So for me to, if you're good enough, people are going to eventually copy you. So I'm just getting the boss ro rolling because that's what they want to do when you're a thought leader. They're looking ahead at what you're doing and they're already copying you subconsciously. From your discussion of your stock trading, it sounds like you do a decent amount of day trading. What's harder, becoming a good magician or a good day trader? <laughs> They're both just as equally hard because you're going to end up spending a lot of money in the beginning. Like with me, I, I would buy stocks and I would just keep one token share. And I didn't make a lot until I started taking really big bets of where I knew I was confident. Like when I bought Google, I was like, I was sure I didn't, I could sleep on it. Like the majority of my stock is in Google and Lenovo. And you, but you said, you, you said something about making 10 trades a day. I mean, do you, do you do fairly frequent buying and selling? Like certain stocks I'm up 20 or 30% and it drops 3% in a day. I'll just buy a thousand dollars worth because anything less than a thousand when it moves, like in the next day, it'll bump back up by one or 3%. I'll literally make a thousand, you know, like so more, more so like a thousand or $10,000 trades. And in a couple of days, it's just going to jump back up the next couple of days, especially if you're looking at cycling between like a Google, Apple or Tesla. Sometimes you get stuck in a position because you can't offload it and you just hold on to it. But I'm doing that more kind of like as a beta test of seeing which stocks go up, whether I'm going to beat the S&P with all this active trading. So for me, it's just more like a, a trail marker because if a company were to hire me and I bought one share of stock, which Men's Warehouse did, and they went up like a huge amount at one time, I knew that they had more money because I knew that they were doing well or something was happening. And as these companies go up, I'm like, wow, let me, let me say hi to, hi to them on LinkedIn, because not only that, the employees probably have stock options if they're high enough up. So they're going to throw a personal party. I'm, I'm realizing, hey, their net worth is attached to the stock compensation. So that is a way that I track not only my investment, but my investment in them. We have a commonality. We have the same goal. I want, even if I discounted a show for them, I'm still invested in them because that's my company. You are an owner as uh, when you own the stock. And most people don't realize it. They think that they're a passive shareholder. I consider myself an owner of Google, which you are. Yeah, it's definitely a way for you to keep feeling connected to those companies that are hiring you and for you and the company to have each other's best interest at hand. So it's an interesting way of looking at things. In my intro, I talked about being in my 20s and regretting the fact that I didn't invest more in those things that I was passionate about. Looking back at your career, if you could change anything, is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah, not leaving PayPal <laughs> as early <laughs> and not talking to Elon as much. <laughs> you know, like uh, who knew he was going to be where he's gonna, he, he is now? And who knew uh, these guys were going to found Yelp and uh, all these other companies? Stripe. Uh, all, there's so many companies that came out of PayPal and I was there on the early days and I didn't keep in contact with any of them except for two or three people. Yeah. So it, I would tell myself, work a little bit harder and ask questions and just try to hang out with more with them. Don't look at everything as transactional. Go to the, you know, like, even though I don't drink, I should have went with them to the bars or if they hung out, just chat. But I was so into magic that it was like my blinders. I was like, I'm going to be a magician, right? Like I was ready to jump ship, but my mom said, no, you, you, you can't leave. You've, I was such a good boy. I listened to my mom. <laughs>
Interesting. So you and I have slightly different different stories, right? Because sometimes I wish I left earlier and you wish you stayed longer. It seems to me you'd end up in the same place from this conversation, this idea of being a leader, of creating legendary things and connecting people is part and parcel of who you are. And maybe that's why your story is so interesting and why you're successful, not only as a magician, but also an investor. It's been a really interesting conversation. I'm going to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life. And if people want to learn more about you, your magic shows, or your ideas in general, how can they connect you? Yeah, I am at the um, millionairesmentalist.com. And I also am on Airbnb experiences. So if you would like to see what a good virtual show looks like, check out uh, Airbnb online experiences. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, I'd like to thank Dan Chan. That's a wrap. After the podcast was over, Dan Chan and I continued to speak and I pushed him farther about his goals of being legendary and what enough really looks like to him. But before we get to that, I just wanted to remind you that if you are enjoying Earn and Invest every Monday and Thursday, if you like listening to the episodes, well, you should go over to the Facebook group and have the conversations we have every day. That's right, the Facebook group is going 24-7. It is full of community members like you and I, and we discuss what's happening in the world. Personal finance, the economy, the latest news, anything is game. Just go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash Facebook and become part of our community. Now I wanted to continue by going to the after show This is Dan Chan and I talking, how should I say, off the cuff. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. I know I threw you some curveballs because I know you felt like I was going to probably talk more about business. But to me, some of what's really interesting about your story is kind of how you ended up where you are today. Um, So... I like this talk of investing, but to me, it's more interesting, not what you're doing with your investing, but how you ended up there. Yeah. Because I think that's a fascinating story because where, how we end up where we are, especially if we're at a place that we're happy is kind of what I've always tried to help my audience, where, where I want them to get. It's like, how do you make the right decisions today that makes your future better? Um, And so I think that's just such an interesting part of your story of how you went through and made these decisions. And I love this idea that uh, you heard people telling you, no, no, no. And you just wouldn't listen to them. Yeah. There was a couple of people who said, go against what if someone's going here, why go there? I, I forgot. There were several people who said it as leaders. They said, you should go where no one is. And then you have no competition. So when people started crowding in or felt like, Hey, you know, like the story in the Bible where, you know, Abraham had so much that he had to move. So I, f- I feel like a lot of times in when, when you hit a certain place, whether you're selling books online or you're selling data, you just have to move to where bigger opportunities present themselves. And you don't know what, where's it's going to be. I would not have guessed that I would have made, <laughs> you know, just as much, if not more on my stock trading in that one year. But I just started daily trading and I didn't expect anything. I was just literally day, day trading. And that right at the end of the year, I look at my portfolio. I'm like, is this right, hon? Is there something wrong? Um, <laughs> like, when, when did this happen? I was so focused. I don't, I don't look at the number. I did it at the end of the year just because of the year end, um, you know, reconciliation to talk to my accountant. Mm-hmm. I just did it as... I'm going to try it. I'm going to learn something about this. I'm going to make a story out of it. And it actually ended up happening. I'm like, wow, this is, this is really weird. I, I, I didn't expect that. And it was only because of the pandemic, because normally I'm so tired. I, I'm, I get home in the morning. I, I have a set pattern, but because I had so much time to surf the internet all the time, my default is to stay in front of the computer and read news because of what I've been told about Warren Buffett. You know, he said he reads this much a day. I'm yeah. like, okay, if he does that, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to take it for, I would, 
I'm just going to listen to exactly what he says. He says he doesn't watch as much TV or whatever. I'm going to, I'm just going to do exactly that. <laughs> so I actually have, uh, I should have mentioned this. Um, it's a little bit in a dormant phase, but I, I, I have a uh, sage of Silicon Valley on Instagram and Facebook. Hmm. I, I just posted a couple, you know, things out there, but I may do something with more of it, but I love the alliteration, like yeah. Magic Man. Yeah, but yeah. you know, he's the Oracle of Omaha. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. And then I claimed Sage of Silicon Valley. So later on, I'm just gonna have to get all my friends to say it, and one or two thought leaders to say it, and then have Business Insider or Fortune feature me again. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's gonna be really powerful. But that's gonna be hopefully in a later chapter when I can say you know, I've made X amount investing, then I'm going to probably pitch fortune and business insider, but I'll probably wait until I hit like at least five or 10 million or net worth and then say, Hey, look at the backstory that this is a magician, but he's really, yeah, a, this is uh, how he got there. So yeah. tell me this, you, you seem to have pretty big audacious goals, whether it be economic and investing goals or whether it be your business goals or your, your magician goals. Like, how will you know when's enough? Like, will there ever be a time where you're like, okay, I've done enough, I can stop? Or do you think you're going to be continuously going to the next thing? I mean, when it hurts doing what you do, like, Mm. I like that was the hardest part for me is knowing when acrobatics was enough. Like, I would train and it get hurt. And it was not you know, like I, it was not fun. And my wife said, don't do that. I, that's the time I should have really listened to my wife is I got hurt <laughs> and I was still doing it. Yeah. Um, for me, magic, it's probably run its course, but I, I still am making money off of it. Yeah. So I can, find, I, I, find I vaguely got that feeling by the way, not, yeah. not that I think anyone else would, but from really talking to you and listening. And I vaguely got the feeling that you've you've got to the point with magic where you feel like you've mastered it enough and you're such a big thinker, your brain's already like, okay, what next? See, I can, no one's going to pay me more for doing an extra trick for the most part. Yeah. They pay you more because you're either on television, you have global reach like David Blaine. Like a lot of the tricks I do versus guys who are on Netflix, I'm doing the same tricks, but I'm getting paid a fraction of it. So I might as well be a, either a thought leader or on reality television or do my own version of something, a combination of something. When I first started, it was magic balloons and juggling, fire juggling, pickpocketing, climbing into a six foot tall balloon. And that was like the gimmick. But for me now, it's like, I need a global reach gimmick where I can sell tickets. I'm thinking in magic, there's a couple of goals I haven't hit, which I want to hit is sell out tickets, $25 a head and sell out at 500 people in or the zoom capacity, just sell that out, like completely sold out ahead of time. That's where I want to go. If I can do that. And that might take me another five or 10 years. And that's not about the magic. That's about hitting a different goal, which is a metric goal because the tricks will probably say the same. It's just the way that I tell the story inside that magic show. So it's not about the magic. I'm going to guess that you're going to say in the end, it's not about the money. What is it about? Why, why is that? A goal for you? I mean, you're living this life, so you might as well make the best of it. It might as be so the best it's, story it's possible. Just, right. It's so it's it's a big goal, right? Something to reach for. Yeah. It's what else are we doing? Like, I could be watching, playing video games, or I can just set a big goal, and if I don't get there, and I haven't hit, I wasn't, I was never on the cover of Magic Magazine, Juggle Magazine, or Balloon Magic Magazine for my wife, and I wanted to do all those, but I at least I set the goal, right. but I ended up becoming something bigger on business insider. Like I wanted a magazine cover. The main goal was like, I just eventually said I wanted to be on magazines or featured in this thing. That was a more, that was more of the core of why I wanted it. It was more about this legend or this, this fame, because with that fame, you're going to sell tickets and you're going to have more of an asking price. So you have the freedom to do what you want, when you want and with who you want. That is to me, financial independence is, would you be doing this if this was still free? And as you can see, we're well over and I'm still talking. This is where I would rather be than anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. No, your, your passion is clear. And like I said, you, I think, I think legendary, you said that a few times and it's really, it's a great term for you because I can see it. 
Like I can see it in you as you talk about these things. It's this aspiration to do it bigger and better and more. Um, I'm not even asking to go to the moon or Mars. I'm just asking to do a, a club, which has been done before. We've had exclusive private clubs and we've had people do investing. So for for that ask, I'm thinking it's kind of a low bar. If you compare it to what Elon's doing and he's already doing what he's doing. So, you know, if I just hit find enough investors and do like a magic castle or or even a smaller goal. I always think if I don't hit that goal, what's the second goal is maybe I'll have this illusion in my house where it looks like a transporter. And I have, I already know it. it's a $22,000 illusion. And I might actually buy a, my house mm-hmm. and put it permanently in my house and do that as my parents. Huh, Cause I'm doing so many virtual shows and I've already made so much off these virtual shows. If I don't have it in my own physical venue, I might just, you know, have it in my own house and just do these show, shows and wow. do it in front of this camera. So that's the one alternative. But if you never set those big goals, you're not going to get there. So I would ask you, if we were celebrating your success, Doc, what would we be celebrating, celebrating drink doing five or 10 years down the line? Yeah. Oh, so I think my goals are are pretty consistent is I think I'd like to continue to grow this podcast. And so I think, you know, a, a, a big audacious goal would be right now, I, you know, get between 35 and 50,000 downloads a month. I'd like to really push that up to three, four, five times that. Um, I'd also like to get a book published through one of the big five publishers about, so I am a physician. I've pulled away from medicine, but I still practice hospice and palliative care. Um, so I've been working on a book proposal about, what the dying have taught me about money in life. And so I'd like to get that accepted and eventually write that book and have it published with one of the big five publishers. But above and beyond that, I'm a little different than you. I feel like I've accomplished many, many things in my life. And I'm actually in some ways looking for a more peaceful solution because I found that accomplishments to me eventually lead to a huge amount of anxiety. Like I've been really accomplished my whole life. And I found that Every time I reach an accomplishment and I'm happy with it for a brief period of time, I eventually then have to shoot higher and it becomes this treadmill that isn't, doesn't always feel good at the end. And so I'm actually at a point in life where I'm trying to say, instead of looking at goals and accomplishments, how can I enjoy the process of doing what I'm doing and how can I shoot for goals that are things I deeply want to do, but don't end up feeling don't end up controlling my whole life and time. Oh, that is, <laughs> that's one thing I can learn from you because I feel like th- these, I obsess over a lot of what. And, um, and the question is, does it make you happy? Cause there are plenty of people out there who that makes them happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. I found for me that it, it was like financial goals were the same. Like I had all these big financial goals and then I met them and I'm like, okay, what now? And I realized that the financial goal really was just a number that I put there. And more important was the lever that it gave me to do what I want. So the lever was I could leave the parts of medicine I didn't like and start pursuing other things. So I started a podcast. I did more public speaking. I did all that. But even there, like sometimes I have to be careful because my I've been such an achiever my whole life, as I'm sure you have. But the minute I start something, it's hard to just enjoy it for what it is or enjoy it while you're doing it it suddenly becomes, but I can use this to get to X or I can bring it to the next level or I can. And to me, like I said, there's, there's some good to that, but I've also found it's also anxiety provoking for me too. So I think there's got to be a Zen state where you are doing things you love to do and having incremental gain that feels good without driving yourself crazy about going too far, at least again, for me now, again, for you, maybe the joy really is getting to that next level. I've just found for me that getting to that next level is only joyful for a certain amount of time. And then it feels almost bad. Like I got to go to the next place. Yeah. I, I, I feel, I totally feel that in a lot of ways, but I feel like if I stop, I won't hit those goals that I said that, uh, you know, like then I won't be able to prove that person wrong that they said <laughs> no. So I'm like, I'm already. Yeah. You, you realize that person you're proving wrong is not someone else, but you, right. Because Ultimately, the people in the world who tell you no, yeah, it annoys you in the beginning. But what drives people to do stuff like you 
is not other people. What drives you to do stuff like you is my guess is from other people I've known like you is it's more you. It's you saying, can I reach this level? And then, and then pushing yourself forward. It might be, uh, but I, I'm not sure because I was picked on as a kid a lot and I wanted to prove myself because of a lot of the situations that were in my life, you know, with my parents divorcing and, you know, you know, being teased about my ears. I, I had a lot of uh, trauma in, as, in middle school. But look at you, you're already enough. Like, you know, think about it this way. And I, I've, I've really gone through a lot of this. So I, I obviously don't know you, but I know myself, right? So yeah. let me answer you the way I'd answer myself if I was mm-hmm. having this internal conversation. You are already enough. Going from what you've done now to opening a multi-million dollar magic kingdom is great, but you're not going to be any more worthwhile because you've done it. You are already, and you've already accomplished amazing things. You've already gone and worked with these big, awesome companies. You've, you know, rubbed shoulders with Elon Musk, at least at one point, you've done these cool, amazing things. None of that is going to make you better. You're already enough now. Yeah. Like, and you're always going to be enough. That stuff is great and it's cool and it's fun if, if it makes you happy and if it provides money that you can hand down to generations. Gener- that's wonderful, but you've already proven yourself. You've already done it. <laughs> the rest is just icing on the cake. Yeah, it's always nice to. What else would I do? What else would I do if I didn't tr- shoot for those goals? I'm 43. Like, but that's that's a big question, and I'm 48, and I'm that's exactly actually what I'm facing in life is, well, who am I then? If I don't, like, I've spent my whole life chasing goals, becoming a physician, being the best physician, getting awards and accolades, making tons of money, right? Like, I got to this point where I was making seven figures a year as a physician, which is almost unheard of as an internal medicine physician, right? Wow. But I've also come to the point, me personally, not you, me, I've come to the point where I was like, okay, but that never ends. And, And it didn't feel to me, it didn't feel peaceful anymore. So I asked the same questions you're asking. I'm 48. I'm a young guy still. What now if there aren't these big audacious goals? And as opposed to saying, well, I'm going to look for more big audacious goals. I've actually personally, I'm delving into this idea of what if there aren't bigger goals? Like what then? Like, is there some type of peace or happiness or contentedness that we find outside of our goals? And to me, that's a, a a big, big thing I'm contemplating and struggling with, because even as I try to do that, my brain still tries to jump. How can I do it better? How can I make more? How can I do? It's like, you know, when you have enough money, I, I have enough money, but your brain still tells you you want to make more, even though you, on some level, you know, you have enough money. But these are all things I contemplate. So when I hear you talk about these things, it's the other side I think doing what you're doing is awesome as if it's joyful, right? So for me, it wasn't joyful on some level. It was, it was anxiety provoking, Mm. but if it's joyful, then I think it sounds great. It's kind of sometimes anxiety because I'm not reaching it or I'm not hitting it. So I'm not, they're not sitting something realistic, but I hit something close. So it's like a pleasant surprise when I, when I do it, I have to think about that. That made me think a lot. I'm I'm glad we ended (laughs) right there because it, it, Sometimes I I need someone to at least tell me that perspective so that way at least I've had both things in consideration, both choices, as opposed to this is my only choice. And I think maybe what it means for both of us is that we do a little bit of both, right? So you still have those big audacious goals and you still strive for them, but then you also build parts of your life which are completely goal independent, which just feel good because they feel good, right? Or mm-hmm. I, I think we forget, I certainly forget to realize that life isn't black and white. There's lots of gray in there, right? So it doesn't have to be all one way. I can find some sense of Zen calmness and happiness and still strive to get a book published, right? Which for me is a big audacious goal. So like you can do both. There's just a matter of, of finding that nice calm in between. 